The overseer explained to her the history of the Order of the Monks of the Sword. All legends begin and end with the slaying of the god of the land by the hero Akor. With the god-slayer sword, he brought an end to God, just as he brought about his own end. Centuries later, the god-slayer was used by Tarin Akor, the theocrat, as the source of his power. A pure descendant of Arkor's bloodline, the theocrat was weak, and the sword thirsted for his blood. He kept alive the bloodline of Arkor, and sacrificed all women of the bloodline to the sword's appetites. The men of the bloodline of Arkor were declared sacred. The theocrat gave his blessing to the monks of the sword, and protected them within this monastery. Eight years ago, at the time of the Second Rebellion, forces marched upon the citadel of the theocracy, led by one known as the Scarred Outcast. For the second time in the annals of the heretic kingdoms, the people of Corwenth rose up to overthrow the rightful ruling power, bent upon the destruction of Tarin Akor and all he stood for. But before the aggressors had even reached the gates of the palace, Tarin's chancellor slew his master, the theocrat, with his own blade. His motives are lost to history. The chancellor gave the godslayer to the monks of the sword, charging them with the duty that they had been prepared for, to guard the sword against theft or destruction. It is a duty they discharged honorably until this very day. The magistrate told her of the first rebellion and the terrible power of the godslayer. Some three centuries hence, the people of Corwinth rose up in rebellion against the Garulian Empire which had reigned over the heretic kingdoms for many years with an unyielding grip. The warlords of Corwinth rose up in insurrection, clashing with the might of the imperial legions and their brutish Sura mercenary allies. Corwinth held its ground, thanks to the fortress of Kyalesa, which held the only pass in the Sundered Shield Mountains. But the warlord of Kyalesa let his greed overpower his judgment, and opened the gates to the Imperial Horde. His betrayal was his own demise, as the God Empress of Garulia despised traitors and would not suffer them to live. The survivors of the rebellion took refuge in the city of Arken, and the Imperial legions laid siege. The Garulians burnt the wheat fields and dammed the river, drying up the wells of the city. The arrival of winter would mean the end of their supplies and inexorable doom. At the darkest hour, when all seemed lost, a weak and feeble man calling himself Tarin Arkor offered hope. If the warlords would help him to acquire the Godslayer, the mythic sword of Tarin's ancestor, Corwinth could be freed. Under the circumstances, the surviving warlords could not refuse his request. Taking the finest heroes of Corwinth, Tarin went to the reliquary, the repository of all the relics of power and fear accumulated in the reign of the god-emperors and empresses. But Tarin had no intention of honoring his pact. Once within the reliquary's walls, he orchestrated the deaths of those who had accompanied him and took the sword for himself. That was how Tarin, the inbred progeny of the sons and daughters of Arkor, declared himself theocrat and made requisite his worship. Armed with a godslayer sword, the tyrannous wretch ruled over the heretic kingdoms with more brutality and casual revulsion than had ever existed under the reign of the Garulian god-emperors. Such is the irresistible potency of the godslayer. The Pentanira recounted the events of nearly a century ago. 
Talion had been one of the monks of the sword whom the theocrat kept alive as breeding stock. Each year, monks were chosen to breed with the theocrat's concubines, the most sacred duty of any monk. Talion was paired with Niri Kantrecht, one of the most trusted members of the theocrat's harem. A child was born of this union, a daughter named Carissa. Carissa was sealed in the vaults beneath the citadel to be sacrificed to the insatiable appetite of the godslayer upon reaching puberty. But Talion had fallen in love with Niri and tried to free her and her daughter. He escaped the citadel with his daughter, but Niri gave her life to ensure their escape. Talion wandered the world distraught and inconsolable at the loss of his lover. It was then that the scarred outcast Quova came upon him. Quova, once a member of the Pentanera, had turned to religion and founded the cult of the Eternal God. Talion became inducted into this cult, swearing to aid Quova to restore the God of the land. Young Carissa never related to her father. He could barely stand to look at her, a constant reminder of his loss. When she was grown, Carissa fell in love with a maid named Solan, a magus of the Order of the Veil. The Order had long wanted to find and punish Quova for his betrayal. Carissa told Solan where the cult of the Eternal God were hiding, and he reported this to the Pentanera, Within hours, Baron Evanger descended upon them to wreak his furious vengeance. But Talion and Quova escaped this slaughter and went into hiding until the day they could acquire the Godslayer and complete their goal of resurrecting the dead god. The Inquisitors were charged with eliminating idolatry and religion by any and all means possible. Serving the original purpose of the Order of the Veil, the fall of the theocrat allowed the Inquisition to announce its existence. It had become the public front of the Order's machinations. The sages were charged with the duty to record all things. It was their burden to be the custodians of all knowledge, but they were forbidden to use that knowledge for any purpose. It was a dichotomy that troubled many who bore the office of High Sage. The preceptors were charged with recruiting new members to the Order of the Veil. All mages of pure atheist intent were inculcated into the Order by the High Preceptor, a position now filled by Carissa Cantrecht. The Magi carried out the Order's experiments and endeavored to be the eyes and ears of the Pentanera in all things. Most High Magi have found that a civic position allowed them most access to the knowledge of the world. The executioners were charged with a duty to eliminate all enemies of the Order of the Veil. That remit extended primarily to all who had broken the laws of the Order, and at times to any who proliferated idolatry and religion. Swift justice was enacted by the High Executioner Baron Tar Evandra, whose dedication to his office rendered him above reproach. The Master Necromancer told her the tale of Quova's fall from grace. Cease Lawen had been the high preceptor from the days of the founding of the Order of the Veil, and to him was charged the duty of training new initiates. Two of his students were the young Quova and Serge Valkyrin, the son of Lady Mara, the founder of the Order. Quova quickly rose to the position of High Sage, but his ambition exceeded his judgment. He abused his position to attempt what is most forbidden, to channel the essence of the dead god alone. He could not control that which he had invoked. The agony of the transmogrification was excruciating. Beyond reason, Quova's essence-infused body could not be controlled. 
he effortlessly slew Lady Mara Valkyrin in a rampage of unquenchable carnage. Terrified, Quova sought shelter from his childhood friend Serge, neither of them aware that Quova had been responsible for Lady Mara's demise. In a moment of weakness, the young Lord Valkyrin aided Quova's escape. When Lord Valkyrin discovered what Quova had done, he threw himself on the mercy of the Pentanera, who absolved him and condemned Quova. Quova sought refuge at the Oracle in the Red Smoke Mountains. There he met and fell in love with the seeress Cassandra, who it is said exists in all worlds at one time or another. It was from the seeress that Quova first heard of the Eternal God. They were happy together, and in time she bore Quova a daughter. A newfound faith and love for his family eased Quova's pain. When the Pentanera learnt Quova's whereabouts, Baron Evanger descended upon the Oracle in a blind fury. He slew Cassandra in his bloodlust for Quova, but the scarred outcast managed to elude vengeance that day. Quova fled, overwhelmed with loss. His faith was all that remained of his love for the CRS, and he built upon it the foundations of a new religion. The cult of the Eternal God sought nothing less than the return of the God of the Land to resurrect that which Arkor had once destroyed. The Ishkai midwife told her of the birth of Quova. In the last days of the Gerulian God Emperors, the surviving members of the Imperial family had taken refuge with their Sura allies at Black Rock Castle. The forces of the Theocrat laid siege to the castle, knowing that it was only a matter of time before the Imperial family's money ran out and their alliance with the Sura would end. Quova was born to one of the younger sisters of the last God Emperor, days before the last of their funds were exhausted. He was given to the midwife's mother as a bond child to raise in safety and hide from the theocrat. When the money was gone, the Sura were forced to cast out the Garulians. Clan law demanded money for service. Every man and woman of imperial blood was slaughtered that day. No one knew that there was one surviving scion of the imperial line. Seeing he was scarred, the shaman of Blackrock Castle raised the child, calling him Quova Blackrock. Born with the macula, Quova proved a powerful mage, even in his youth. When he was twelve years old, Quova was found by Cees Larwin, who offered to train the boy in the path of the mage, in ways the shaman could not. On the day he left, he was told his true parentage, but Quova swore that the Black Rock Sura would always be his only clan. The imperial line of the god-emperors and empresses of Garulia vanished into the dry pages of history.